Sorry, I couldn't come to Israel to give this uh, talk. My topic is uh, history of the vector potential. Uh, most of the content of my talk uh, have already appeared in this uh, article by uh, Alfred Wu and myself. The vector potential was uh, introduced uh, by many people uh, in various uh, contexts. Uh, of this, uh, Thompson and uh, Stokes uh, were perhaps uh, the most important. In a letter uh, dated uh, in 1850, Thompson wrote to Stokes, My dear Stokes, do you know that, etc., etc., that, etc., etc., is what is now called the Stokes law or Stokes theorem. Uh, we all know that uh, that is the foundation of uh, differential geometry. Maxwell wrote three papers. Uh, the second paper was uh, published in five uh, installments. Commonly, it is uh, thought that uh, paper three is the most important. Uh, people usually call that the origin of Maxwell's equations. Actually, Maxwell's two key ideas were in the first two papers. In the third paper, he only put the two together uh, and uh, created the name of a field theory. Uh, if we look into Maxwell's uh, first key idea, in paper one, it was uh, the idea about how to understand the Faraday's electrotonic state. The electronic uh, state, electrotonic state, was a vague idea which Faraday had believed to had believed in, but was unable to clearly define because uh, Faraday uh, did not know very much of mathematics. In 1881, years after Faraday and Maxwell were both gone, Helmholtz had this to say. Faraday found that an electromotive force striving to produce these currents arises wherever and whenever magnetic force is generated or destroyed. He concluded, that means Faraday concluded, that in a part of space traversed by magnetic force, there ought to exist a peculiar state of tension, and that every change of this tension produces electromotive force. This unknown hypothetical state he called provision, provisionally the electrotonic state, and he was occupied for years and years in finding out what this electrotonic state was. In 1856, Maxwell found the answer to this puzzle. And that was that the electron, electrotonic state was the vector potential. In modern notation, we would write E equal to minus A dot. He published this in paper one. He was 26 years old. That he knew he had landed on something important and that it might uh, lead to uh, disputes about credit uh, he was uh, very well aware of. So in the, at the end of the paper he had this paragraph. With respect to the history of the present theory, that means the electrotonic state is equal to A. I may state that the recognition of certain mathematical functions as expressing the electrotonic state of Faraday and the use of them in determining electromagnetic potentials and electromotive forces is, as far as I am aware, originally. This is, uh, in my opinion, a completely fair statement. But the distinct conception of the possibility of the mathematical expressions arose in my mind from the perusal of Professor W. Thompson's papers. You see that here Maxwell was very careful. He did borrow from Thompson the idea of the vector potential. 
So he was afraid that Thompson might uh, take offense. That's why he made the statement. But in Thompson's papers, although there were extensive uses of the vector potential, Thompson never linked that with Faraday's ideas of the electrotonic state. So the credit should go to Maxwell 100%. This to Maxwell, A, is central to his understanding of electromagnetism. That is probably why in all his later papers and in his books, he never eliminated the vector potential. But now, before we go on, let me mention a puzzle. Maxwell knew that the vector, put the vector potential was not uniquely defined. So we should ask, which choice of A in modern language, which a gauge did he select to be the electrotonic state? In writing this, uh, in formulating this formula at the bottom. If you want to search through that paper, one of his, this is the paragraph which has some bearing on this uh, puzzle. Maxwell wrote, we have now obtained in the functions alpha zero, beta zero, gamma zero, that means the components of vector potential, the means of avoiding the consideration of the quantity of magnetic induction which passes through the circuit. Instead of this artificial method, we have the natural one of considering the current with reference to quantities existing in the same space with the current itself. To these, I give, I give the name of electrotonic functions or components of the electrotonic intensity. The emphasis in red were Maxwell's original one. This is the only paragraph in which perhaps uh, Maxwell was really referring to the, the different gauges. This paragraph seems to suggest that he chose a gauge where A is inside of the electro electric wires. If so, does there exist such a gauge? Does there exist such a unique gauge? All of these questions Maxwell never mentioned. And uh, this uh, remains perhaps an important subject for the historians of science to look into. Be that as it may, it is clear that the, that the vector potential being identical to Faraday's uh, idea of the electrotonic state was uh, Faraday's, was Maxwell's great first discovery in his paper one. Then in his uh, second paper, the key idea was the displacement current. This has been well discussed in recent literature. This is again a very puzzling uh, development because as I said earlier, paper two was published in five installments called the part one, then part two, part two, then part three, then part four. And it was only in the fourth installment, part three, where the displacement current occurred. In earlier parts of this paper, you find the diagrams, intricate diagrams like this, with the vortex motion. These are very uh, intricate. What was clear was Maxwell was struggling to find a mechanical model to explain uh, the vector potential being the electrotonic state. Then suddenly, in the fourth installment, we find the following paragraph. Proposition 14, to correct equation nine of part one of electric currents for the effect due to the elasticity of the medium. This correction was the addition of the displacement current. So, puzzle, another second puzzle. 
How did Maxwell arrive at this correction? This is a question that I've studied for some time and did not know, did not explain. Maxwell evidently in the first three installments struggled to make a mechanical model that he thought would in some sense be the analog of electromagnetism. In the process of this, perhaps uh, when he tried to study the question of charge conservation, I, I don't know, maybe when he landed on the idea of trying to explore the question of charge conservation, when he uh, realized that he needed to add an additional term. Uh, this, in my opinion, is another great puzzle in the history of uh, physics. After Maxwell's death in 1879, Heaviside and Hertz independently presented Maxwell's equations with A eliminated. Heaviside especially was extremely happy with this elimination. He said in 1889, the Psi and A are murdered. Psi is the scalar potential. The Psi and A are murdered, so to speak, with a great gain in definiteness and conciseness. In 1892, he said, the duplex method, the duplex method being the method using E and H without A, the duplex method eminently suited for displaying Maxwell's theory and brings to light many useful relations which were formerly hidden from view by the intervention of the vector potential and its parasites, the parasite being the scalar potential. <laughs> of course, we all know that indeed it is true. After we eliminate the vector potential, the equations look uh, more symmetrical with respect to uh, a dual transformation exchanging E and H. And that evidently was one of the reasons that the greatly delighted Heaviside. So after Heaviside and uh, Hertz, there existed the dogma. The dogma says the electromagnetism resides in E and H. Where E and H are zero, there's no electromagnetism. This became a dogma, and in the first uh, 60 years of the 20th century, this was what every student of uh, physics was uh, uh, trained in. When I was a student in China, and later a graduate student in Chicago, uh, this was the thing that we all learned. Then came 1959, the great paper of Aronov and Dome, the paper that we are gathered here today to celebrate. Their proposed experiment was finally done by Tonomura et al. quantitatively. That experiment was a decisive one which shattered the age-old dogma and revealed the true importance of the vector potential. And that is that in quantum mechanics, E and H underdescribe the electromagnetism. Only knowing E and H is not enough. Even when E and H are both zero, there is still possible electromagnetic effect. On the other hand, if you take the loop integral of the vector potential over all loops, that over describes electromagnetism. In other words, you do not need uh, that much of the information to, to uh, realize all the electromagnetic effects. It is this expression, which over all closed loops, that correctly describes electromagnetism. Thank you. <laughs>